times that Andrew was involved uh, as, as kind of a headline in the story, and he was always bringing somebody, we kind of have the same thing with Thomas, that, that Thomas three times in the Gospel of John, it kind of gets a headline. And, and all three times that, that we're going to look at this evening, he's speaking. He gets a speaking part too. Now Thomas overall in the New Testament is mentioned 11 times. And seven of those 11 times are in the Gospel of John. Five times that Thomas is mentioned, it's as part of a list. Part of the list of the apostles or a list of other disciples that were serving Jesus. And that means really, in all reality, we don't know that much about Thomas. And so we need to be careful in any time we discuss something of assuming information that's just not there. We can only go by what the Bible says in a lot of these cases and understand, especially when it comes to the apostles, there's a lot of tradition around them, but that tradition is exactly that. You know, for instance, uh, Thomas, outside of the Bible, well, in and outside of the Bible, he's known as Thomas the Twin, or, or as you read in the King James Version, Didymus. We don't know who he was a twin to. We don't know if that meant he was a twin brother. We don't know really where that nickname came from, so we just know, as him, as, as, know him as Thomas the Twin, and it's assumed because of that he must have had a twin. I don't know why he wouldn't. But then there's another book entirely called The Gospel of Thomas. And it's made waves over the years. It's, it's been very popular. Uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one publisher published the four Gospels as we have them in the New Testament plus the Gospel of Thomas and made them equal weight. But we do need to understand that the Gospel of, of Thomas does not, does not keep the characteristics of canonicity. Or, in other words, it doesn't belong in the New Testament. Now, it has some interesting information it has some information that agrees with the Bible, but I can go find a whole stack of books that has some information that agrees with the Bible. The problem with the Gospel of Thomas is it has information that doesn't agree with the Bible, and also information that is just actually factually incorrect. And so it's not infallible, therefore it's not inspired of God, and so it doesn't belong. And the Gospel of Thomas carries on the story of Thomas after Jesus dies. It carries on a story that Thomas continued preaching, which that's a pretty safe assumption, but it has him preaching in India and China, and boy, that would be neat if we could prove it. But we can't. There's just not enough information. And I know it's been suggested that the, the, the tomb of St. Thomas is, is in India still today, and there's markers and uh, 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 all sorts of things that, that, that they claim that is... Well, I can also show you a rock that's supposedly Lot's wife uh, uh, on the southern tip of the Dead Sea. But we can't prove it. We can't verify it. We don't have enough information. And so what we want to be careful with doing is just looking at what does the Bible tell us about this information. Because that can be verified. Because first of all, it comes from God. But second of all, the Bible has been proven over time and time again to be the most accurate book to ever be recorded that when we find archaeological evidence it supports what the bible says when we find geographical information or scientific information it supports what the bible says uh, if you're following along and done your bible reading already today you read about the the sabbatical year we were just talking about that science tells us now that we need to allow land to lie fallow so that it can replenish the nutrients so that you can continue growing. That was not a practice done in the ancient world. And notice how much that ancient world is still devastated because of that. See, when we find out the information later on, it doesn't disagree with the Bible. It verifies the Bible. And even though we haven't found all the information yet, and we may never find all the information to verify every single word of the Bible, we don't have to. Because so much of it has been verified, we can take what we haven't verified as reliable. So we're going to stick with what the Bible says about Thomas. That's, that's the short of what I just said. 
And we're going to look at at what we can draw from his character and see how he met the challenge. Now, maybe you're already ahead of me. Maybe you know what I'm going to say, that when we say Thomas, we all think doubter. Doubting Thomas. And maybe you've already had lessons in the past or studied it for yourself, and and you've almost said, well, maybe maybe we misunderstand Thomas and that, that event that we know him for. And that's why I want to go back in John to chapter 11. Because we're going to see something in John chapter 11 about Thomas's character that does go against him being just known as the doubter. Now, the context of John chapter 11 is that, that Lazarus has, has passed away. And if you remember, it said, you know, some, some, some messengers come to Jesus and say, you need to get down here. Lazarus is very sick. And Jesus says, it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come later. And, and again, they come and say, you know, no, really, Lazarus really needs you. And Jesus goes, it's okay, he's just asleep. <clears throat> and, and Thomas and the other future apostles say, well, then, then, then if he's just asleep, let him sleep. Let him rest. And that's when Jesus tells us, no, Lazarus has died. Let's go. And in verse 16 of John 11, that's when Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us, go with, let us also go that we may die with him. Because Thomas understood an even broader context to this verse, not just about Lazarus' Lazarus's death, but about the, the swelling persecution of Jesus. If you go back to John chapter 10, go back to verse 22 where it says, Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are Christ, tell us plainly. So Jesus at this feast is being challenged on who he is. Are you really the Messiah? That would be the term they would have been using in Hebrew. Are you really the one we've been waiting for, the one we've been looking for? And that's where Jesus answered them in verse 25 and said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep as I said to you. In other words, this is about as plain as day that Jesus says, yes, I'm the one you've been waiting for. But he immediately says, but you don't accept it because you're not of my sheep. You know, he even understood that probably in that moment they're asking him to try to entrap him. Well, we can really ferret that out because in verse 31 of chapter 10 it says then the jews took up stones again to stone him their reaction to jesus affirming he's the messiah is he's committed blasphemy let's execute him which which if if he wasn't the messiah is exactly what they should have done jesus says in verse 32 many good works i have shown you from my father For which of these works do you stone me? So when they're about to throw rocks at him, to the point of executing him through such a method, he asks, which thing have I done that makes you want to kill me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. So they fully say, we're going to kill you because you've blasphemed and said you're the Messiah. And we strongly disagree. In verse 39, it says, after Jesus responds to them, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. See, the context to what Thomas says is that Thomas realizes last time that they were in Judea, where Lazarus's family lives. Last time they were in that region, that close to Jerusalem, they wanted to arrest Jesus. They wanted to condemn Jesus. They wanted to execute Jesus. And that's why Thomas says, all right, we'll go see Lazarus, and we'll all die while we do it. Now I want to ask you a question. 
Does this sound like someone who's not sure if Jesus is really Christ? Does this sound like someone who, who is wavering in faith at this moment in time? Does this sound like someone who we would call a doubter? I think Thomas here shows that he's another D word. He's devoted. He is devoted to Christ. He's devoted to Christ's cause. He's devoted to go even to the point of death of following Jesus. He was ready to die with Christ during Christ's ministry to the point that he says, fine, we'll go see Lazarus and let us all go die with him. He's leading others. What he thinks he's doing is he's leading others to their death. But he's willing to do it because he's devoted to following Christ. And, and here's the takeaway for us. Just take a pause here and see that, that how devoted are we? If we knew that we were going to be killed for following Christ, if we really believed that, would we? Would we follow him wherever he was going? Even if we thought the trip was unnecessary? You know, what's interesting is in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we're actually not called to die for Christ. I, I fully understand if it came to that, if it came to someone pointing a gun at you and saying, if you say you admit you follow Jesus Christ as the Messiah, I'm going to shoot you, I, I would have to say yes. But notice what Paul says in Romans he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. See, Paul says, don't be looking for opportunities to go out and die for Christ, but make yourself a living sacrifice for Christ. Don't wait for the moment for someone to point a gun at you to say, yes, I believe. Act like you believe all the time. Serve him all the time. Be devoted to him all the time. And be devoted enough to give him your reasonable service. To obey him and do what he's asked us to do. I think sometimes we get so worked up about waiting for persecution to come to prove we're following God that we don't follow God. Thomas was ready and devoted to follow Jesus even to death. Are we devoted enough to follow Jesus in life? Well, that said, I do want to look at another time that we see Thomas speaking, and that's in John chapter 14. Just maybe a page over, uh, in my Bible at least, we, 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 we see Thomas again is, well, let's set the setting again. In John chapter 14, we are still reading the events that happen in the upper room. I, I, I sometimes feel, because I know I do it, so I, 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 I just want to assume other people do it, that because of these chapter divisions, we think like, like it's complete scene and a complete change and we're somewhere totally different, but, but that's not how the Bible actually is written. Unless we're told there's a scene change, there's no reason to assume there's a scene change. And so in John chapter 13, we're in the upper room, and we have the disciples' feet being washed. And we have the curiosity of, okay, we know there's a betrayer among us because Jesus has told us there is. Who is it? Who is this betrayer? And even when Jesus points out the betrayer to them, none of them believe it because it can't be Judas. He's the most religious one among us. We trust him with our money. It can't be Judas. But by the time chapter 13 ends, Judas has, has left the room. And Judas is on his way to the Jewish leadership to betray Christ to them. Also by the end of chapter 13, Peter has been warned, you're going to deny me also. You know, in the upper room, I can't help but wonder if there was just a lot of emotions amongst a lot of confusion. 
when you have Jesus going down the row and saying, and you're going to betray me, and you're going to deny me, and by the end of this, all the, in the next few days, you're going to be just scattered. You're not going to any of you be beside me. But he still washes their feet. He still institutes the Lord's Supper. He still is teaching them to the very end things they need to know to be fully following God and devoted to him. And so that's the context for Jesus saying, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In chapter 14, verse 1. Verse 2 goes on to say, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So Jesus here is telling his followers, don't be troubled about what's about to happen that you don't understand or even really know. Don't be troubled by that because I have to go by myself. And I have to go prepare a place for you. And don't worry, that place is going to be great. There's going to be room for everybody. It's compared to a mansion. It's going to be fabulous. And if I go prepare that place for you, it only makes sense that I'm going to come back and get you. It only makes sense. And you'll know. You'll understand it. And that's when Thomas does what, what I can't help but wonder if everybody in the room was thinking. Excuse me, Jesus? Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? If we want to say Thomas ever had a doubt, here's where Thomas is doubting. But notice what he's doubting. He's not doubting Jesus. He's not doubting who Jesus is, and he's not doubting his devotion. He's just saying, I don't understand. How can we get there when we feel like we know so little? You know what's interesting is Jesus' answer is, is one of the simplest answers we might ever read in the Bible, especially when you're reading through the Gospel of John. And Jesus is being questioned so many times by different groups of people, by his followers, by his enemies, by the Pharisees, by by the politicians. He's being questioned by all these different groups. And you read some of those answers. Well, I read some of those answers, and I just start scratching my head and going, okay, I think I can figure this out. But here he doesn't do that. Here he just simply says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' answer to Thomas is, follow me. Just keep following me and I'll get you there. You know, actually, Thomas ends up in these conversations being part of of so many greater conversations, whether it be the the admittance of I am the way, the truth, and the life, or later on in the chapter in verse 15 where it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's Thomas and the other's questions that get these well-known, memorized verses out of Jesus so that he can teach them what we all want to know. And what he says here is Jesus is the way. Jesus and following Jesus and loving Jesus and obeying Jesus is the way to go with Jesus. See, Thomas's doubt wasn't in the form of questioning who Jesus was, but questioning how to follow Jesus better. Really, the application for us in this case is, is, is we need to stay devoted and devoted enough to continue following, even if it doesn't make sense in the moment. Even if we don't know exactly what the ending is, we need to stay with Christ and devoted to Christ. It makes me think of another well-known verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which reads, and I'll try not to sing, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I can't help it. I just do it in the cadence. 
But we do it in the cadence because it's a wonderful verse to sing, as hopefully we all do, because it's saying, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm living for Christ. I'm doing what Christ wants me to live to, to do. And, and, and I'm doing it through faith that He is the Son of God and that He saved me. See, our doubt isn't in the form of who is Christ. Our doubt is the form of now how do we follow Him? And the goal is to continually work on following Him. Uh, in this essence, keep that kind of doubt going so we can find out better how to follow him and do what he wants us to do. And that's what Thomas's goal was. He wanted to follow Christ to death. He wanted to follow Christ where Christ led. And that spurns his questions. So all that to lead us to the point in John chapter 20, where Thomas gets his infamous nickname as the doubter. Now again, we set the setting. Christ died. He died on that cross to the point that his closest followers disbanded. They're they're disillusioned. They don't know what to do now because the one they thought was going to lead them in a movement has died like everybody else does. And that wasn't what they were expecting. But then, Jesus starts appearing to people. And then, rumors start spreading. Did you hear what what Mary saw? Did you hear about those two guys that were on the road to Emmaus? Do you know what John and Peter did? He got in a race, running all over the place that Sunday morning, and and John beat him, but Peter passed him at the last second and went into the tomb. These stories start spreading, and you just, you see various reactions when you read through this section, but, but notice in verse 19, what happens then the same day evening uh, this is of John chapter 20 excuse me verse 19 then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them peace be with you so the disciples are gathered and they're meeting but they've locked the doors because they're afraid that in this heightened moment of of politics meeting religion that something bad might happen to them and so while the doors are locked jesus appears in their midst and says peace be with you when he had said this notice verse 20 when he had said this he showed them his hands and his side then the disciples were glad when they saw the lord so jesus said to them again peace to you as the father has sent me i also send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained so jesus shows them the evidence of who he is by showing them the marks that were put on him at his crucifixion and says peace to you The Father's been with me, the Father will be with you. And he gives them some kind of taste of the Holy Spirit. This is the setting that leads to verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Okay, the disciples were gathered together. They locked the doors. Jesus appeared. Thomas was late. Thomas wasn't there. You know, it makes me think if I had a teacher in college that he said if you showed up late on a test day, the doors were locked, you couldn't come in. I didn't believe him. It wasn't me, though. I was inside the room when... (laughs) It was silence. I mean, other than the kind of snickering as we're writing on our papers, like, oh, he's not really not going to let him in, huh? Then a note slid underneath the door. And the teacher went over and slid it right back. See, the doors are locked. 
And you were either in or you were out at that moment, and Thomas was out. We don't know if he arrived late. We don't know if he had something better to do. We don't know what Thomas was doing, but he was not there. And so the other disciples, therefore, said to him, verse 25, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the prints in, uh, 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 in his hands the prints of the nails and put my fingers into the, print, uh, the prints of his side, I will not believe. Go back to verse 20 and compare verse 20 with verse 25. Because I think what we miss is that the disciples go to Thomas and they say, here's what we saw. We saw the nail prints. We saw his pierced side. And Thomas says, well, I want to see that. Thomas wants to see the same exact thing that everybody else saw. He wants the same exact blessing. He wants to, to be part of this. He's not saying, well, I'm out. He's saying, I'm in, but I can't be in unless I have what you have. Now, we can look at this one of two ways. We can say, well, he doubted. it. But, but what happens when Thomas does finally see Christ makes me think that he was so willing to be in, he just wanted to be equal with all of his companions. He wanted the same evidence they received. I've said the same thing when I'm reading through my Bible and said, Boy, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have seen that. It just make it all that much more real, make it concrete in our minds if we could witness the actual events we read about in the Bible. Wouldn't it just be, be grand to see them? Now, Thomas may be asking it in a form of, of negativity, but he's asking for something I think we would all very much like. An eyewitness account. Okay, well, let's read it. Verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were in, again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your fingers here, and look at my hands. And reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Jesus appears and says, here it is. Here's what you've been asking for. I wasn't in the room. I'm not that old. So I really can't tell you for certain where everybody was sitting and standing and how they were positioned when the next line of text happens and neither can anybody else. All we can go is by what Thomas says. He says, my Lord and my God. There's no reason to assume he is talking to anybody but Jesus. There's also no reason to assume he actually put his, his fingers on the nail prints or his hand on the side. Because even though he said that's what he wanted to do, he didn't need to anymore. Again, that's how we as humans talk. Boy, if that guy was here right now, I'd really stick my finger in his face and I would tell him a few things. Really? Because he's right outside. And don't we usually back down when we find that out? Don't we usually not speak in such high rhetoric when we realize that our opportunity for confrontation is not as available as we thought it once might be when we didn't think we'd really have to do it. I fully believe Thomas may have even intended to put his hand in his side, but he didn't because he didn't have to because he saw it. Now that's based on some assumption, I admit but no more than any assumption that others have made erroneously based on this passage. What we really need to come around to is what he says. He says, you are my Lord and you are my God. 
You are the one we've been waiting for. You're the one I've always believed in and the one I was disappointed at what happened to you, but now you're back and I'm all in. Thomas believes. And Jesus accepts that. Jesus accepts that by says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are you who have not seen, are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He accepts Thomas. Now, if we put in all the events that happen after Jesus resurrects, you know, he wasn't. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And so many of us see that as Jesus giving Peter the opportunity to make it right. But with Thomas, there's more immediacy. More, more immediately that Jesus says, you believe, good. Yeah, it's fair to say Thomas doubted. But I don't think it's he doubted who Jesus was as much as how to follow Jesus, and then secondly, what to do now that he thought Jesus was gone. And you know what the interesting takeaway is about this, this so key event in Thomas's life and in the Gospel of John is that, that we do have the same witness that Thomas has. I know what I just said. I know I said I wish I could have been there and wished I could have been in the room and I wish I could have seen it with my own eyes. I know I just said that, but guess what? I don't have to be there to believe it to be true because Thomas was there and Peter. Hey, let's throw in Matthew for good measure. The eyewitness accounts of biblical events are so overwhelming that we can believe them, we can trust them. Why, why, why would Matthew copy Mark's account when Matthew was there? And by the way, who copied, who did John copy? Nobody. He was there. And he's writing of the events he saw with his own eyes. These are the eyewitnesses we have. And, and honestly, the only, the only thing skeptics can give us on why they say these are not, these are not, Reliant, reliable, is because they're very, very old. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to a very educated skeptic, but I've witnessed many conversations with very educated skeptics. And I can't help but always think, so how far back can we trust? Can we trust that World War II happened based on eyewitness accounts? Yes. Can we trust the Civil War happened based on eyewitness accounts? I, I heard a skeptic say this. Yeah, we can. Can we trust that the Revolutionary War happened? Okay, I'm stuck on wars, but you know. Based on eyewitness accounts? Yes. Can we trust that, that the Reformation happened in the 1500s based on eyewitness accounts? Where is the line of demarcation that we say we can no longer trust it? Because historians trust the accounts of Thucydides and Julius Caesar, who predate Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if we're going to set rules for what we can and cannot trust based on how old it is, let's play fair. Besides, look at what it says in verse 30 and 31 of John chapter 20. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John makes it very clear in his gospel and in his first letter that I'm writing these things as an eyewitness to tell you you can have faith in Jesus Christ and everything that he can do for you because of what I've written. Oh, there's many other th things he did, many things we don't know that we don't have recorded, but we have these recorded for a purpose. The purpose is proving what Thomas needed, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. 
And based on the evidence that Thomas received, that John received, that the other writers of the New Testament received and the writers of the Old Testament got to see, based on all of this evidence, that's why we, like Thomas, can be devoted to Christ. And devotion to Christ means we'll follow Christ by putting our faith in him by leaving sin behind us in repentance, by confessing that he is Christ and our Savior, and by being baptized as he commanded for the remission of our sins, and by worshiping him in spirit and truth, and by going out into the fields of harvest and bringing in, and by helping those who are in need we see around us. We need to stay devoted to Christ because we have all the evidence we need to believe he is who he presented himself as, not just the Messiah, not just God in flesh, but as our Savior, so that we can be with him in that place he's prepared for us. So if you're not devoted to that, we want to encourage you to become devoted to that. And if we can help you do that this evening, please let us know. And let us know now by coming forward while we stand and sing the invitation song. This is a time, oh, then be wise, be saved, oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Will thou be saved? Refuses none who would to him their souls unite. Believe, obey, the work is done. Be saved, oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Once again, be sure to grab a bulletin on your way out. Don't forget 10.30 a.m. ladies class tomorrow, 6 p.m. tomorrow, Monday night for the master, and then 10 a.m. Wednesday morning, Broadmoor uh, devotional. Um, I think that's everything we have scheduled for this week, uh, but be sure to grab your bulletin for stuff that's happening later in the month. We have all sorts of things coming up with the ladies' day next month and different things like that, um, and all sorts of prayer requests. Is there anything we need to announce? All right, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in song number 510, first verse of number 510. 510. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a witful eye to Canaan's fair and 
Happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Oh, sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much that we could be here again this evening, Lord, to honor you and to worship you in song and in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the lesson of your, uh, your servant, Thomas. Father, just help us to always ask the important questions when they need to be asked. Lord, to just focus on the wonderful Lord and Savior that we have in Jesus, but to also seek those ways that we can follow him, to seek more and more information about him and his will for us, so that truly we can follow you all the days of our life, just like so many wonderful servants we get to read about in your word. Lord, thank you so much for the eyewitness accounts, the truth that is found in your word, and thank you so much that has been preserved and translated so that we can know it, so that we can understand it, and we can teach it to others. Please, Lord, guide us as we go out into this world. Please, Lord, protect us on the slippery roads and in the snow and in the cold temperatures and help us to always serve you. Please be with those who are on our hearts and our minds right now, especially be with those who are comforting, who need comforting during grief and all the difficult decisions that will be coming up in the future. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.